does the imminent so-called pure mathematics set time as time over against space as the second material for its consideration? Applied mathematics does indeed deal with time as well as with motion and other concrete things. But the synthetic propositions, that is propositions regarding relationships determined by their notion, it takes from experience and applies its formula only on those presuppositions. The fact that the so-called proofs of propositions, such as those regarding the equilibrium of the lever, or the relation of space and time and the motion of falling, and so forth, are often given and accepted as proofs itself only proves how great is the need of proof for cognition. Seeing that where nothing better is to be had, cognition values even the hollow semblance of it and obtains from it some measure of its satisfaction. A critique of these proofs would be as noteworthy as it would be instructive, partly in order to strip mathematics of these fine feathers, partly in order to point out its limitations, and thus show the necessity for a different kind of knowledge. As for time, which it is to be presumed would constitute as the counterpart of space the material of the other part of pure mathematics, it is the, in a, it is the existent notion itself. The principle of magnitude, of difference, not determined by the notion, and the principle of equality of abstract lifeless unity cannot cope with the sheer unrest of life and its absolute distinction. It is therefore only in a paralyzed form, that is, as a numerical unit, that this negativity becomes the second material of mathematical cognition, which, as an external activity, reduces what is self-moving to mere material, so as to possess in it an indifferent external lifeless concept. Lifeless content. In section 46, Hegel is continuing this criticism of what he calls mathematical cognition, or canon, that he began several passages ago, and he's going to introduce a new question here, namely that of time. So let's review for just a moment what do we mean by mathematical cognition? He doesn't just mean mathematics as a discipline or as a subject matter dealing with numbers, dealing with quantity. What he means is the extension of mathematics into practically everything. The use of it as not just a model, but also a means as a, and a medium for making sense out of all reality. And this was actually something that was, you know, a, a real going concern in... Um, the, or the early modern and even late modern era that, that he's sort of at the cusp of. We can speak of the mathematization not only of nature, but also this conception that was running through a lot of people's ideas that, that went on all the way to the Logisus project in the 20th century, that mathematics could really be the basis for making sense out of everything. Mathematics understood in a very broad uh, conception of it. And... Why does Hegel consider this to be problematic? Here he's going to discuss it in terms of pure mathematics and applied mathematics. So for those who aren't quite familiar with that, that distinction, it's probably good to dwell on it a little bit. So when we're talking about pure mathematics, we're talking about engaging in mathematics, you could say for its own sake, without considering how it can apply to particular experiences, particular problems, particular things that we're, we're interested in. We're looking at the relations uh, numbers bear to each other and all the operations that we can perform on them um, and everything that can be you know, reduced to or expressed in terms of number. We're looking at that for its own sake, perhaps you know, with an eye to applying it later, but in order to make sense of it on its own terms. Now, when we're talking about applied mathematics, what we're talking about is something that's more experiential. It does, in fact, have a, a sort of, you know, universal schematic quality to it as well. A lever is a lever is a lever, and we can have a general idea of a lever. But we make sense out of levers by reference to actual lived experience to some degree. So Hegel is going to say, how do these two ways of doing mathematics... How do they understand this very important metaphysical, what do we want to call it, not even a concept, this, this very important metaphysical reality, uh, 
something that we have to take into account that we call time. And he says, so-called pure mathematics does not set time as time over against space as the second material for its consideration. What does he mean by that? Well, if you think back to your mathematics, whether you had it in, in high school or college or, you know, if you were really advanced, you did some of this in middle school, and you think in terms of dimensions, the Cartesian coordinates, right? And think of it in two dimensions. You can represent uh, a plane, and that could be representing spatiality. You can come up with equations that describe whatever figure that you want to. Leibniz already pointed this out, that any, any figure you can think of, you can come up with some sort of mathematical formula, however complex, that would express it. What about three-dimensional things? Yes, we can. As a matter of fact, that's why we can do things like, like 3D printing, which is really, you know, a large extent, an extension of what's been going on in factories with modeling and, and uh, design for quite some time. Now, what about if we add a fourth dimension? Oftentimes people will talk about time as being the fourth dimension, and the reason why this whole idea of time as being the fourth dimension came about is because if you represent time as a variable like the variables in space, then you can chart things out, not in a way that we can actually you know, look at in, in, in graphic terms, uh, we can do sort of approximations of that kind of thing, but we can conceptualize it in terms of another dimension. You know, you can have x, y, z, and then t. And you can say that what's happening in terms of x, y, z is dependent on where things are at time t, time t is, you know, one, pick whatever notation you like. If you do that, Hegel's saying, you're really not treating time as something distinct by itself, you're just treating it as yet another type of variable, which is like the variables of spatiality. And you can do this, this works. As a matter of fact, it has a lot of applications in real life. But are you adequately grasping time by doing so? Hegel would say no. What about if we turn to applied mathematics? If we're, if we're looking at the world of experience, where, you know, the terminology that he's using here, he's saying, you know, everything that, that we look at as being uh, synthetic propositions, these are propositions regarding relationships determined by their notion, these are taken from experience. These are not, when you say that something is a synthetic proposition, he's using this, this Kantian terminology, it means that things are being brought together. You can't derive what it is that the proposition is saying just by looking at the parts of it and saying, oh, aha, there we go. There has to be some sort of process of inference going on. Kant thought that you could have synthetic propositions a priori where you don't have to have some sort of experience involved. Um, that's not really that big of an issue here. Hegel's point is everything that we're calling synthetic, everything that we're calling, um, you know, universal truths in terms of mathematics, in terms of motion, experience, you know, mechanics, he uses the example of the lever, all of that is actually derived from our experience or the experience of other people that we've, you know, accumulated over time and gradually turned into a discipline, or, or a set of disciplines. You know, mechanics is really applied mathematics. Um, Descartes actually has this depiction of a tree that mathematics is the root of, and then metaphysics, and mechanics is one portion of it. Medicine and morals were the other two uh, branches coming off of it. So he says, the fact that the so-called proofs of propositions such as those regarding the equilibrium of the lever, the relation of space and time, and the motion of falling, are given an acceptance of proofs, only proves how great the need of proof for cognition. Seeing that, where nothing better is to be had, cognition values even the hollow semblance of it. His point there is not to say that it, it, it's all, you know, fabricated or forget all of it. He's not uh, introducing a kind of skepticism there. He's saying, look, the things that you're actually calling proofs are not proofs in any sort of uh, 
real sense, which demonstrate the necessity of the phenomena that we're, we're looking at. So we're not going to get our heads around time as philosophers, as you know, scientists in the Wissenschaft sense of science, those who are trying to understand reality, as metaphysicians, we're not going to get our head around time by thinking of it in terms of mathematics. Here, I'd like to bring up a little bit of a digression as well. Um, why would there be this sense that we ought to think of time in terms of mathematics? Is it just that we're attracted to math? Well, you know, this, this idea has a long pedigree goes all the way back to Aristotle, who said that time is the number of change, or quantity, or however you want to, to parse it out, of kinesis. Kinesios, actually, in, in the Greek. Um, and sometimes this is talked about in terms of motion, but he, he's really talking about the broader category of change. He also says a few other things about time that I'll get to in a moment that, that tie in more closely to what Hegel is expressing here. Well, let's fast forward now to somebody else who's very important in the understanding of the relationship of time to number, and that's Augustine. Augustine uh, says that, strictly speaking, at least from our perspective, the present is all that there is, and it's this tiny little slice, and now this present's gone. The past doesn't exist. The future doesn't yet exist. So where does all this stuff come from? How do we measure something that doesn't actually exist, i.e. time? Well, we measure it because we actually have a capacity for keeping track of it, and we do so through a kind of numbering. For example, if we're talking, he uses the examples of long and short syllables, because Latin poetry actually was not based on rhyme, uh, end rhyme as we're used to in English. It was instead based on meter. And meter depends on long and short syllables, it depends on the vowels, there's a whole long story there that I don't need to go into. Suffice it to say, what Augustine was pointing out is that in our minds we actually compare experiences against each other and we can say this experience is twice as long as that one. Now, is it time itself that's dictating that or is it our imposing a structure on things that's doing so? That's the key question there. Of course, with Augustine, there's God in the picture, and so there's the divine mind, and that, that complicates things as well. Fast forward now to, to Kant, who is, you know, looking at these matters after having had, you know, some, some great mathematicians themselves trying to make sense of these things, like Newton, like Leibniz. Kant will treat time as something that is not out there existing in itself, but actually something that is a form of our intuition of, of things. We, we actually have to put our experiences into time and space as well in order for them to, to be able to make sense to us, in order for there to be sequence. And so again, time and number are intimately connected in the minds of many of these people who are, who are treating metaphysics. So Hegel's going to depart from them and he's going to ask, you know, what is time? In order to broach this question, we really need to get away from mathematics and engage in metaphysics. And Hegelian metaphysics is phenomenology. It is attentive to what's going on in consciousness. How do things actually appear to us? So he says, um, as for time, which it is to be presumed would constitute as a counterpart of space, the material of the other part of pure mathematics, time is the existent notion itself. That's a strange thing to say, because he's not treating time merely as a medium in which other things can occur or be you know, oriented towards each other. He's saying that time itself is the existent notion or concept. He says, the principle of magnitude, of difference not determined by the notion, and the principle of equality, cannot cope with, and here he brings up another key term, the sheer restlessness of life and its absolute distinction. Now he's not just talking about being alive, he's talking about life in a metaphysical sense, life as that which actually pervades things. Life is itself in motion, 
but it's not just like a cycl cyclical circular motion. It's not, you know, random. There is purposiveness to it. There is development that takes place. Also decline from time to time. But what's going on is what he's calling the development of the notion. And it's happening through, for human beings, who are the ones who matter, of course, history. We've gotten very far away when we talk about mathematics. We've gotten very far away from mathematics in talking about history. So he says, mathematics and any sort of approach that's going to found itself basically on mathematics cannot actually take account of what's really going on with time. This doesn't mean that it can't grasp certain aspects of time. It doesn't mean that, you know, in treating it as, as a quantifiable dimension like space, like the three dimensions of space, that it's doing something wrong. It's just that that's not an adequate way to understand reality as it develops for human beings who have meanings. There's a few other things that, that really ought to be said at this point about this. He's saying, um, what happens when we try to mathematize this? What we're actually trying to grasp slips through our fingers. He says, um, negativity becomes the second material of mathematical cognition, which as external activity, remember we saw that mathematics doesn't really reveal the insides of things. It's a schema that gets superimposed on them. It reduces what is self moving to mere material so as to possess it in an indifferent, external, lifeless content. This is the real danger of mathematizing things. It can actually work. And when it does work, it doesn't grasp what it's leaving out, and you can't point out to the, the not the necessarily the mathematician, because mathematicians are, are actually quite um, aware of this, but to the person who's bedazzled by mathematics as a medium for doing this sort of stuff, you can't get them to see that something has been left out because when they, you know, when they say to you in good faith, well, show me what's been left out, they're going to demand that it be placed in terms of mathematics. I mentioned that I was going to bring up one other point about Aristotle. Aristotle in the physics where he's saying that, that time is the number of motion with respect to before and after, he also says something else that's very important, which is more in line with what Hegel is saying here about time and about number. Aristotle says that time is that in which potentiality and actuality really work themselves out in relation to each other. That's part of what Hegel is trying to get at in talking in terms here of life, of motion, self-movement. He's talking about the development, not from pure possibility, not from any sort of, you know, mathematical seed that would have to play itself out in a certain way, algorithmically or, you know, iteratively, but rather he's talking about how potentiality, in an Aristotelian sense, develops itself into actuality. For us human beings, that involves, in part, purposive activity and choice. And that's really what history is in large part composed of. It's a product of all of that. Likewise, so is building or culture. Philosophy, on the other hand, has to do not with unessential determinations, but with a determination insofar as it is essential. Its element and content is not the abstract or non-actual, but the actual, that which posits itself and is alive within itself, existence within its own notion. It is the process which begets and traverses its own moments, and this whole movement constitutes what is positive in it and its truth. This truth, therefore, includes the negative also, what would be called the false if it could be regarded as something from which one might abstract. The evanescent itself must, on the contrary, be regarded as essential, not as something fixed, cut off from the true, and left lying who knows where outside of it, any more than the true is to be regarded as something on the other side, positive and dead. Appearance is the arising and passing away that does not itself arise and pass away, but is in itself 
that is, subsists intrinsically, and constitutes the actuality and the movement of the life of truth. The true is thus the Bacchanalian revel in which no member is not drunk, yet because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. Judged in the court of this movement, the simple shapes of spirit do not persist any more than determinate thoughts do, but they are as much positive and necessary moments as they are negative and evanescent. In the whole of the movement seen as a state of repose, what distinguishes itself therein and gives itself particular existence is preserved as something that recollects itself, whose existence is self-knowledge, and whose self-knowledge is just as immediately existence. Close to the end of Hegel's criticisms of mathematical cognition, we have this interesting section, number 47, where he's not going to talk about mathematics at all, but he is going to talk about Bacchanalian revels, in which no member is drunk, yet be because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. So when you think about Bacchanalian revels, which is where we want to get to, uh, in, in this, this, this chapter, and indeed through the phenomenology, you want to think of a big party that you've been to where people are actually moving around, dancing, singing. Um, you might think of a festival rather than a party, because I think for, for many of us, parties are a little bit more sedate than that. In any case, a Bacchanalian revel, what, the way that he's picturing it here, a Bacchanalian revel would be one in which everybody would be drunk because Bacchus is, in fact, the god of wine. He's Dionysus in Greek, he's Bacchus in, in uh, Latin. But now imagine one where there's a kind of equilibrium and repose to the entirety of the party, the entirety of the revel, even though every single part itself is, in fact, off-kilter, off-balance, drunk, and there you've got an image of the entire development of the shapes of consciousness as they're detailed here in Hegel's Phenomenology. This is an image that one should not lose sight of if one wants to understand what's going on in Hegel's discussions. There's always going to be a loss of equilibrium. That's part of what drives the dialectic forward. But, understood as a whole, we can reach a point where we, as the sort of privileged observers uh, in Hegel, can see that, you know, this, this whole thing is like a calm, clean progression. So it's like a, a, a mirror image, a, a distorted mirror image to some degree, of what's going on in, in history. In any case, he starts out saying philosophy is concerned with what? With what is essential, and that means that it's going to be concerned with what is actual, what is wirklich, what is able to do something, to exert itself, to show itself, to appear on the stage. And he's going to talk about appearance in just a moment. So he poses this dilemma, how should we understand what is actually essential? How should we make sense out of this? And there are different ways in which one can do this. One classical way of doing this in philosophy, and you still see a lot of people doing this today, is that we're going to concentrate on what can be the case in, in every time, irregardless of circumstances. That's where we need to really put our focus. We need to abstract away from the concrete. We need to abstract away from experience. Or we need to at least say all of our experiences in this respect are going to be equal. And, you know, that's uh, a way of doing philosophy that a lot of people have, have espoused over uh, time. The problem is, when you do that, what is abstract will also be something that's not actual. So, is what's most important is what's most real, is what we really need to grasp, to work our, our, you know, our rear ends off and our, our, our brains to comprehend. Is it something that's not actual? Is it something that's purely ideal? Is it existing solely for the mind? 
or perhaps as a cultural artifact or something like that, or is what's essential in some respect what becomes actual? What has to be brought from mere abstraction or potentiality to the state of actuality, to actually existing in concrete shapes, in spaces, in times, in cultures, here, there, in this person, and in differentiated ways, ways that are somewhat, um, again, off-kilter. He uses this term self-positing there. Another term that he uses is um, um, that which is alive within itself, existence in its own notion. And here he's not just talking about individual existences. He's talking about important things that come on the scene in time, in history, in culture, perhaps recurringly, more often than not, but through persons, through subjects, through actually existing concrete human beings. And the question here is, should we be paying attention to the eternal, which is where, you know, a lot of philosophy has been looking, or, and Hegel has no problem with actually using this word evanescent, meaning that which just sort of rises to the surface and exists for a moment and then is gone. You know, what is evanescent is, you know, for example, mayflies that are born for a day, mate, and, and die. But mayflies as a species continue. That's part of the point here. And so what we need to do is a little bit of erasure so we can see the, the bigger point that he's actually trying to make by introducing this distinction or this dilemma that we have to grapple with. So he's got this, um, this famous passage talking about the, the Bacchanalian revel in which no member is, is not drunk. And what is he talking about there? He's talking about... Let's think about this. We've got a party here. And we've got people in the party. And what happens at parties? People get drunk. They pass out. They dance for a while, and then they're no longer on the scene. They're off the scene, right? And then somebody else comes in to take their place. And in this way, the party can continue and continue and can continue. And sooner or later, all of the original party members have actually left. Perhaps some are passed out in bedrooms under coats. Some hooked up with each other. Some, you know, drove off and threw up in the bushes somewhere. And others are coming in to replace them. I don't need to draw a million different X's here. You get the idea of what I'm, what I'm after. Hegel's saying that there's this continual process. Now, let's think of this not in terms of a party and people getting drunk, but in terms of truth. In terms of the truth of appearance, the truth of the evanescent. He says, because each member collapses as soon as he drops out, the revel is just as much transparent and simple repose. Judged in the court of this movement, the simple shapes of spirit. So now think of each of these as being a simple shape of spirit or geist, consciousness through history. And I am erasing this in part because we want to think of these as sort of along these sort of lines. They're existing, then they cease to exist, they're succeeding each other. Perhaps we should actually put, you know, all sorts of different things, Y's, O's, you know, Greek letters, numerals. The point is, there is a process here. And considered from the point of view of any one given part of the process, it's completely incomplete. It's inadequate. What happens just with this stage is something comes on the scene, appears, develops itself, is revealed as inadequate, you know, the negativity of it arises, and then it's superseded by something else, 
And this may be, as Hegel says, sublated, that is, you know, aufgehoben, that taken up into, in its essential moments, into the next stage. But it's, it's done. Remember, we had this metaphor earlier on about the flower, the bud, you know, the seeds, all of that sort of stuff. That's the same sort of process. So, considered from the point of view just of one individual state, the single shapes of spirit do not persist any more than determinate thoughts do. So imagine, think about your own thoughts and how ephemeral those are. You're thinking about one thing, now you're thinking about another thing. Now you're probably thinking about Hegel, and in five minutes you're going to think about, should I have a sandwich? The shapes of consciousness considered in history are as ephemeral as that. But, he says, they are as much positive and necessary movements as they are ne negative and evanescent. In the whole of movement, in the entirety of the process, considered in a state of repose, what distinguishes itself therein and gives itself particular existence is preserved as something which distinguishes itself within and gives itself particular existence is preserved as something that recollects itself. That remembers this entire process. And this is where Hale himself would say that he is as he's writing this book. This is where we ourselves, as we're following along, that's the position that we really occupy. All of this has happened already, and we're, we're following it out. We're watching the appearances. We're seeing how potentiality works itself into actuality and then reveals itself as having yet more potentiality that hasn't been realized and that works itself out more and what's here in the past starts to die off and give rise to something else and new changes occur. All of that is able to be grasped from the vantage point of these things having occurred. So he says, something that recollects, recollects itself, whose existence is self-knowledge, and whose self-knowledge is just as immediately existence. What's important to point out here with respect to that passage are two things. One is that this is going to be a more theoretical perspective than the active perspectives that are going on through the development of history. The other thing is, this is very important, this vantage point has to be one where we ourselves grasp that we are at this point. We are the ones who have the responsibility of looking back at all the developments of history, seeing what occurred, going through them as much as we can in imagination or perhaps emotion or appreciation, and then conceptualizing it. We cannot be, as you might say, pure passive consumers of something like the phenomenology. A, a consumer attitude towards this of just, just show me the stuff, just entertain me, just give me the data. We've already seen that Hegel says, look, you're not going to get anything out of this book if that's the attitude that you take towards it. You have to, to some degree, go along for the ride. 